My friends, it is a great joy that we introduce our first preacher for the moment. Yes, we've got two preachers today coming to you live, uh, unrecorded, but most importantly, filled with the Holy Spirit. And first of all, it is Minister uh, uh, Aaron Alexander. And his word, his word for ministry, y'all, is covenant. Because I believe that God has placed upon his heart a covenant word and a covenant spirit. And so without hesitation, let us welcome at this time Minister Aaron Alexander. He will give us our first word today as we worship and praise God on Theological Education Sunday. time and space. Before we go on into prayer, I want to give thanks and acknowledgement to uh, Associate Pastor Pastor Lanson and uh, Head Pastor Reverend Dr. Jerry O'Cannon for sharing this space with us seminarians. Thank you, C.N. Jenkins Session. Thank you to the uh, AV team and all those who make this service happen. Thank you. C.N. Jenkins, if you could, let's join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I remove myself and invoke your spirit right now, God. Father God, I pray that you'll speak through me and use me. Father God, we thank you for our many viewers who are tuning in. And Father God, we pray that the Holy Spirit will run rampant through the internet. Father God, touch them through Facebook, touch them through YouTube, and through whatever streams they may be seeing in this service. Father God, we will continue to hold to your unchanging hand. And God, we give grace and honor. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, C.N. Jenkins. Thanks for joining us this morning. And, and again, it is, it is a esteemed pleasure to be in this space with you. 
If you could join me in our morning scripture reading, it comes from John 15, verse 16. Again, John 15, verse 16. And it says, You did not choose me, but I choose you, and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Seeing Jenkins, with your help and the help of the Holy Spirit, join me in our sermon title, What is God's Calling for Your Life? What is God's Calling for Your Life? For many people of faith, that question is a source of mystery, frustration, confusion, and hope. Does God have a fine-tuned plan for each of us, or is God's call more general? With details, we feel left to us. You like to find the same number of answers as the number of people that you ask. But there's work that God calls us to do, seeing Jenkins, and it's laid out for us in the Bible. God makes it clear again and again that we are to love others, care for the poor, and live our lives in such a way that it points to the power of the gospel. When we contemplate what God calling is for our lives, those universal commands are a great place to start. So seeing Jenkins, do you ever wake up feeling like you don't have a purpose? Waking up feeling like you don't have a purpose can be frustrating, if not downright maddening. Amen? You look around and you see on social media and look at pictures and you see your friends and coworkers living passionate, engaged, meaningful lives. They have deep relationships and good jobs and a sense of direction that compels them to hop out of bed each day with a pep in their step. You know that God has something good in store for you. You don't believe he intends you to live a life of drudgery. You don't want, him, you, don't want you to live a life of draggery. After all, the Bible is full of passages about joy. While this certain doesn't mean that every single day is going to be a parade or a circus, it does mean that an overall sense of gladness should permeate your life. In Psalm 63, verse 7, David said, For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. See, Jenkins, how can we get to that place? How can we get to, to that place where we're singing for joy? Well, today, we're going to first talk about some key signs that you may not be living in the fullness of God's purpose and calling for you. Then, through the help of the Holy Spirit and key biblical suggestions, we're going to begin diving into how can we begin living a purposeful, full, calling life. Before we dive into any points, we need to make this one, one caveat. You know, in one sense, you're always living in God's purpose. God is God, and God works in all things, including your life, according to your purpose. Nothing happens without God ordaining it. So that takes me right back to Psalms. Psalms 57, 2. I cry out to God, my most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Let me say that again. I cry out to God, most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. This is key to understanding God's purpose for your life. God has numbered your days and fulfilled you with every purpose he has for you. However, our choices and actions really matter. Our choices and actions, they really matter. In some ways, this is a mystery you can't fully understand. But that doesn't mean it's not true. When we choose to do things, we can choose to bring, do things that bring us more joy and happiness. Let me repeat that. We can choose to do things that bring us more joy and happiness. So while we park there, let's look at five signs that you may not be living to the purpose of your life or accepting the call for your life. First, you're blatantly living in sin. Let's start with the obvious here. If you're blatantly disobeying the Bible, you're not living in God's purpose, and you'll certainly experience turmoil over and over again. This one is pretty straightforward, so we're not going to spend too much time parked here. We're not. Secondly, you lack joy and excitement. If you wake up every day filled with dread, total boredom, you're probably not living to your calling. God has created you uniquely. God has really good things for you, 
One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. Sure, now, there will be difficult things you encounter in your life that requires patience and persistence, like the patience and the persistence is going to take when we in the voting lines on November 3rd. We're going to stand in line. We're going to stay there. It's going to rain. It's going to hail. And we're going to stay right there. I digress. But overall, you should have a sense of joy and excitement that fills your days, your work, and your relationships. Thirdly, you work so that you don't have to work. You know the feeling of pointless work, church family. You go to the office. You clock in, you clock out, you go to lunch, you send some text messages, you answer some emails, you get home, you clap, you collapse in front of the TV, eat a TV dinner, spend maybe 10 minutes with your family. I want to watch some sports. I want to watch A&E. Uh, I'll get to the Bible later on. Maybe tomorrow. I'm too tired. Matter of fact, you work for weekends and retirement. That's, that's the sole focus. Why you work? I work for, well, I work for weekends. I love Saturdays. Why you work? I work for retirement. How old are you? 20. Woo, you got a long time to go. Probably the only joy you get is from your hobbies and maybe your friends or side jobs. Ecclesiastes 8.15 says this, and this is Ecclesiastes 8.15, and it says, check this, and I command joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat, drink, and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Would you say this kind of joy characterizes your life, Sin Jenkins? If not, you need to rethink where you're headed. Fourthly, you feel stuck. Do you feel stuck, Sin Jenkins? Have you ever felt stuck, Sin Jenkins? If you desperately want to change, but you're also stuck in your life, it's, also, it's really a sign that you're not walking to God's call in your life. Trust me, I'm no one draft picking this. I've been avoiding my calling for 25 plus years. I started seminary at the age of 40. So I'm talking from experience in Jenkins. Those who are stuck want to go in a particular direction, but don't know how to get there. So they spin their wheels endlessly, frustrated by, and unsure how to make the frustration in. Do you feel traps in Jenkins? And lastly, you have no direction. If you don't know God's purpose for your life, you constantly feel hopelessness. You feel as though you're wandering from one thing to another with no progress. Nothing excites you and you don't have any specific goals that you're working towards. Unlike the Israelites who wandered for 40 years, they actually had a goal. They actually had a, a goal and that was the promised land. But you, you don't even have a goal in front of you. But old C.N. Jenkins, let's change the tone right now because God has sent me in this time and space to give you good news. And today we're going to discover how to live in that calling of your life. My Christian friends, at this point, while since we're online, if you do have a writing utensil with you or any way to take in some, some notes, your notes with your cell phones or your tablets, please join me in doing so. My Christian friends, look at five ways to discover God's calling for your life. Five ways to discover God's calling for your life. Number one, this is simple. Go to God in prayer. Go to God in prayer. That's obvious. If you feel purposeless, ask God to give you wisdom and direction. James 1, 5 states, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously without reproach and it will be given to him. It doesn't get more straightforward than that. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. Number two, dig into God's word. Dig into God's word. The primary way God speaks to us is through the Bible. Not Power 98. Not CNN or Fox News. The primary way God speaks to us is through the Bible. This means that one of the first things you should do in search of God's purpose is start digging in the scripture. 
Now, you won't find any verses to tell you how to be an NFL player or a dance instructor or ministry of music, but you will begin to understand the heart of God. And it comes from digging in the scripture. Thirdly, determine your gifts and strengths. God has given you specific gifts and strengths. Maybe you're a math whiz or a wise counselor. Maybe you have a mind for electronics or you're an up-and-coming seminarian or you have a mind for business. Maybe you're great at organizing people or getting things done. Now check this in, Jenkins. Check this. God's purpose for you probably already involves, surprise, the things you already good at. Think about it. God's purpose for you is probably the things that you're already good at. That's not difficult. What are your talents? What am I good at? That's what God bless you with. Fourthly, determine your passions. What is one thing you're particularly passionate about? Really, this could be anything. Business, art, economics, alleviating poverty, whatever. If money wasn't the issue, what would you do? If money wasn't the issue, what would you do? And lastly, take a solitude retreat, a.k.a. a vacation. <laughs> Sometimes it can be incredibly helpful to get away from it all and take unheard time to just think, pray, journal. You don't have to spend a week in the woods for this to be effective. Even just a day away, a day away from the hustle and bustle can be hugely rewarding. Doing these retreats, allow yourself to simply be still, to ponder, to ask God for direction, and to listen for his voice. It doesn't need to be complicated and doesn't require any elaborate rituals. Hebrews, Hebrews 11.6 is a reminder that God is always reward those who seek him. And it states, the Lord is not hiding in the dark, trying to keep his will hidden from you. The Lord wants to guide you. In conclusion, Sin Jenkins, trust God. Trying to discover your life calling can be stressful, overwhelming. It can seem like such a big, confusing, frustrating subject. What is my call? You want to move forward, but you're not sure how. You want to find purpose, but you feel life aimlessly wandering around. But you can trust God who wants to lead you where he wants you to go. Before I close, I want to leave this part at Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 6. Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 6. And it reads, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope and you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen, St. Jenkins, and be well. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the word that you have placed into our spirit and placed into our hearts. And God, we believe this place now in our soul. And God, we pray that as that seed takes root, that as Minister Aaron says, it will bear much fruit. Fruit that shows that you are in charge, that you are in control, and that you are the God of another chance. We thank you, God, that you allowed us to hear a word from one that you've called, and we pray that you will fill his cup, that it overflows abundantly, that each, each time that he stands to speak and to preach and to teach and to share an anointed word, that he will know that he's bearing much fruit. And we ask now, God, that as we've received, may we also give. We pray this prayer in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Let all who believe say amen. 
My friends, what a joy, what a joy it is to receive that word from Minister Aaron, and thank you, Minister Aaron, for your faithfulness and your commitment. Again, his word is covenant. That's how he describes ministry. We prepare now to receive our second word for today, coming to us from Minister Dana Purdom. Minister Dana's word is obedience, and obedience is one, I believe, that controls and directs her life. And in so doing, let us continue to worship and praise God for our second word today on Theological Education Sunday. Uh, one of our students, Minister Dana Purdom, her word is obedience. But she has a word from Almighty God. So get ready in the chat box. Go ahead and type, say, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And I'm excited to receive the good news of the Lord. Let us receive now Minister Dana Purdom. mercy. You promised to never break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Our scripture for today is coming from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 22 through 33, the New International Version. Hear the word of the Lord. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Our sermon title today is going to be, Why Not Me? Obeying God can sometimes lead to rough sailing, wouldn't you say? How many times have we been afraid to obey God? Because we don't know how God is going to do what they said they were going to do. Because we feel that we don't deserve God's goodness. Or because we don't know what the other side is going to look like or how or what we're going to look like on the other side. As long as Peter kept his eyes stayed on Jesus, he was good. Nothing could stop him. He felt he could conquer anything. He felt fearless. But the moment he took his eyes off Jesus, what happened? He began to sink. And I wonder how many of us have been going through life and everything is going great. Everything is good on the job, at the church, with the family and friends. And because everything is going so well, we slowly begin to take our eyes off Jesus. We stop praying as much. We stop attending church as much. We stop reading our Bibles like we used to. And then, boom, life throws us a curveball that we aren't expecting. There are times in our lives when God has allowed us to dwell in a space for a period of time, for such a time as this, today, to give God all the glory. Through our own choices in life, we have all become what I like to call career students of life. And by that, I mean that life is the only classroom where you take the test first and then learn the lessons later. It wasn't until I went through a bankruptcy did I learn how to budget. It wasn't until I went through a toxic marriage did I learn what healthy relationships and marriages were. It wasn't until I became addicted to alcohol did I learn what it truly means to live a sober life. And here I am today, having lived the life that I've lived and learned the lessons that I've learned. I'm here today because I am in the will of God. I've kept my eyes stayed on Jesus throughout my walk, both knowingly and unknowingly. And in no way has it been easy. There were many times when I wanted to quit, to give up, and yet I'm still here. As a fellow career student, the place where I once saw death is the place where I'm now standing tall, seeing the glory of God manifest in my life. A season that I went through for 13 years, divorce, homelessness, alcoholism, severe depression, suicidal ideologies, but, and you've got to love that conjunction, but, God's holy hand covered me and didn't allow me to succumb to the evils of the enemy. I kept fighting, I kept pushing, and I didn't know how I was doing it, but I know it had to be spirit within me that was guiding me along the way. As I've told my story many times before, I sat quietly at the back of the church, the third row center aisle, holding my breath so that I wouldn't draw any attention to myself every Sunday for nine years, angry at God for what was happening to me. But every Sunday, Pastor Cannon delivered a rhema word from God that was just for me that kept me coming back. 
And because I refused to believe the reports of the enemy, my heart was softened. And I began to hear from God myself. And I got pregnant with a ministry. I began to lead Bible studies at church, assisting with Bible studies outside of church at college campuses and with nonprofit organizations, something I had never done before. I enrolled in seminary, and I'm now completing my third year. I went from sitting at the back of the church to now preaching in the church. And in this virtual reality that we're living in now, I'm in these digital internet streets preaching and serving as a featured guest panelist. My obedience to God has increased my faith. Opportunity after opportunity keeps dropping in my path, affirming me, building my confidence, and proving to me that I am meant to be here. I'm already in the spaces that others have tried to keep me out of. I am called, and thus I am qualified. I'm doing the womanist work my soul is calling me to do as my ancestor, Reverend Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, has challenged me to do. My obedience to God is answering the call that came in the wee hours of the night on February 7th, 2017, because I remember the exact date. It allows for blessings to flourish in my life beyond my wildest dreams. And so like the song that we heard the lyrics say, when I look in the mirror, I see a girl beautifully broken and perfectly flawed. I'm the perfect person to go through this storm. It won't break me, it won't kill me, and I will move on because my faith is getting stronger every day. I'm removing everything that's in my way, so why not me? And so I ask you, why not you? Are you listening for God? Are you asking like Peter, Lord, is that you? If it's you, tell me to come to you. Are you looking for an opportunity to stretch your faith like Peter? Is there something deep within that's been nudging you and won't let you go? In light of this time of coronavirus, of being forced into a virtual realm of living, of continued civil unrest resulting from unlawful murders and lynchings of black bodies, why not you? We lost a justice of historic stature on Friday, the Honorable Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Because she joined the League of Ancestors on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, one of the two high holy days in the Jewish tradition, my sanctified imagination drove me to dive deeper into my study of this Jewish religious tradition. According to Midrash, Jewish wisdom, a person who transitions on the eve of Rosh Hashanah is a tzaddik. And I wish you could hear me say that. It's spelled T-Z-A-D-D-I-K which is Hebrew for a person of great righteousness. And in an interview with NPR, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said herself that she always felt she was born under a very bright star. Molly Conway, a writer, describes it as this. This doesn't just mean that she was just a nice person. It means that she was a thoughtful person who worked tirelessly to create a more just world one that would perpetuate equality and access, one that wasn't reliant on charity, one that was for a better people she did not know without expectation for praise or fame. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a champion of gender equality. She fought for Americans with disabilities, for immigrants, for people of color, for LGBTQIA community. And in her 80s, in her 80s, okay, she became a legal, feminist, and cultural icon, affectionately named hashtag Notorious RBG. Her most famous dissent was that of the Voting Rights Act and why its protections are still necessary. She fought long, she fought hard, and she showed us that there's never a time to give up. If, Ju if Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Notorious RBG, can fight through colon cancer, a first bout of pancreatic cancer, cancerous growths on her lung, heart stent surgery, a gallbladder condition, broken and fractured ribs from a fall, and most recently liver cancer. Who are we just to give up and concede? I'm not accepting that. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and our ancestors who fought on our behalf would want memories for her to be blessing and for revolution. 
So now is the time to use our voices. Now is the time to use our vote. Now is the time to fight for victory. History making events happen in real time. And that's the tweet because that's what my pastor would say. So what if 2020 isn't canceled? What if 2020 is the year the church has been waiting for? What if 2020 is the year that you have been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, that it forces you to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awaking you from your blind slumber. A year you finally accept the need for change. Then declare the change, work for the change, become the change. 2020 isn't canceled, but rather it's the most important year of them all. And for so many more reasons than now more than ever. The year that you ask yourself, why not me? The year that you answer your call. So the good news, my friends, is that God is waiting for you to make the first move. God is waiting for you. Just as Jesus told Peter, come, the invitation is there. You've got to make the first move and come. So ask yourself, why not me? Amen. A word from God for the people of God. Thank you for being a part of this service. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week.